My name is Yoshua Shuki Cohen. I'm a data scientist here at Similar Web. And today my talk would be about samples that were not born equal. So here's the agenda. We're going to begin with some problem statement. Then we're going to go over some proposed uh, solutions. Uh, the next uh, phase would be to talk about inverse propensity weighting, which is the main part of this talk. And then we're going to end with some practical tips. Uh, this work is a, it was done with uh, Yaniv Katz, who is a machine learning researcher here at Similar Web, and and the, the credits are also for him. So let's begin. Problem statement. So imagine yourself that you have several panels of users. Each panel is a group of users who agreed to share with us the application's users. So for example, here are panel one, two, and three. And we want to estimate the percentage of active users for a specific app. So in this um, fictional uh, app we are talking about is Rumi. I just made it up, OK? So we want to estimate the percentage of active users for this app. Now each of these panels, we know who, uh, who have like, the amount of users who use this app, OK? So in panel one, two out of seven, panel two, uh, three out of eight, and so on. And we are looking for the pi tilde, if you can see here the guys in the back, which is the actual percentage of act active users throughout the total population and not only in the panels. So it might be two out of seven, three out of seven, or eight, of eight, sorry, one out of six. And we know that the panels are biased. Each of them is biased in some kind of way. So for example, panel one might be biased towards fresh parents, the second to female fashionistas, and the third one might be sports fans. And how we know that they are biased? So for example, we can see that a um, typical app for sports, for example, in, we are talking about the US, by the way, it might be NFL app. And we can see that the top fan, uh, the panel that we suspect that is uh, made out of biased towards uh, top, uh, uh, sorry, uh, sports fans, is overestimating the proportion of users in this app. And so goes with the oil panels. So for example, if we're, we're looking on the, uh, the Google app for, uh, for family tracking, so we see that the panel number one that we, we, ask, we assume that is biased towards fresh parents is overestimated with 25%. We don't think that 25% of the population use this app, right? But we know it's somewhere in between the 25%, 4%, or 3% that we saw, we see in the other two panels. And I gave just, uh, for example, uh, YouTube, and that is a big app that it might be a, a bit less biased, right? Because all of us are using YouTube, kind of. So we know that they are biased, and now we need to come up with pi tilde, the percentage of active users for Rumi. Let's formulate it a little bit further. So we have the total amount of users for each of the panel. We denote it by n over here. And k is the amount of app active users for each of the, user, for each of the panels. Sorry. We define pi by the proportion between k and n, which is obviously less than 1. So given the s panels, we need to come up with pi tilde, the percentage of app active users. So guys, do you have any idea how to come up with a solution? Um, before I want to hear you, I want to hear what you think, but before that I want to say that this situation is kind of similar to what um, Nate Silver faced when he had to pr predict uh, US elections back in 2006, I think. So he had also several, of pa several panels of users throughout the US made of different uh, demographic um, characteristics, right? And he had to come up with, I don't know, his pie tilde would be the percentage of Republican um, party voters. And it's kind of the same because we also have S panels and we need to come up with one pie, pie tilde that is the percentage of, act of app active users. So do you have any idea you want to share with us? Yeah. I think some of a very high level demographic feature such as age or whether somebody voted in the previous election then you wait your panels to reflect the biases in a specific panel or survey. So as I formalize the, the, the problem, this is not a situation, we don't know the demographic right now, right? 
You just know then N, the amount of users in each panel, and K, the app active users. That's it. But you do write when we we'll go, uh, we're going uh, to talk about it a little bit later. It said that uh, we should reweight users according to their demographic uh, characteristics. And it's kind of what we do with uh, propensity score weighting. Okay? So let's begin with some uh, estimation with methods. That's what we are facing right now. We'll begin with some naive um, um, solutions, but we, I want first to go over evaluation criteria. So obviously, we don't have labels, right? This is an unsupervised task. If we do have labels, we shouldn't have the, the need to estimate uh, the app active users. So here we came up with some guiding rules. The first one is panel size. We know that bigger panels are of low variance. They are more stable over time, and they are granularity proof, right? If we have a panel that is very, very big, like hundreds of thousands of users in the US, yeah, we can estimate small uh, apps where with very small panels that are, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of users, we can't. It will be much more granularity issue. Consensus between panels. If we know that few, some panels uh, agree on the percentage of app active users, that might indicate that they are somewhere around the truth, around the, the true uh, proportion of app active users. And the third guiding lines is that we need to handle our inherent panel bias. We saw that each of these panels is biased. And if we can come up with a solution that does account for that, that would be better for us. So here are the, some naive estimators. On the left side, we can see Charles Darwin with his theory of the strong survive, kind of. And here what, uh, what we can do is just to sum all the users we saw throughout all the, the panels and we divide it by the total users we saw throughout all the panels. So actually, we are ignoring panels separation. And in this method, in this estimator, we actually we give bigger panels more weight over to dominate, actually, over smaller panels. And here what we do, we, do, we give some uh, meaning to the panel size, because as I said, bigger panels will count more than smaller ones. But there do, there's no, do nothing to do with consensus between the panels or the inherent panel size. On the right hand, we have Karl Marx with his total equality theory that says we should treat all the panels equi equi as equi equi equally important. Sorry. So we're just averaging them. As we saw before, one uh, out of six, two out of seven, three out of eight. We just average this, these th three numbers without regarding the panel sizes or whatsoever. So here we do uh, give some um, importance to the, to the consensus between these three panels, but nothing to do with the panel size or the inherent panel bias. So that's not so perfect so far. Let's try to do something more complicated and go to try, try to do something with a Bayesian estimator. So we can use Bayes Bayesian inference to incorporate these two assumptions. That we can say that pi s is a prior distribution, what we saw before, comes from um, a beta with alpha and beta. That would be our prior distribution for all the pi's. Okay? And the likelihood would be ks is a binomial distribution with n as the amount of trials and pi s that we saw from the prior as the proportion of success to enter the app. I don't, I don't want to dive much into it, but uh, if we uh, take these two plug it into the base rule, we get a posterior distribution that's also di uh, distributed by beta. And here the new alpha is the alpha prior plus ks, and the new beta would be beta prior plus ns minus ks. And what we actually do, uh, we can take the expectation of a uh, pi s given ns ks, that would be, um, as you can see here, this term, that would be actually the smoothed term of pi s, and you can see that as the, big, the panels bigger, they are less affected by the prior, right? If K and N very, very big relative to alpha and beta, they will be less affected by it. And to come up with pi tilde, we just average between the three. And if we go to our criteria, so we do account for the panel size, as I just said, and consensus between panels and to handle inherent panel size, uh, bias, sorry, 
it does really depend on how we choose our prior, right? If our prior represents some consensus or account for the inherent bias, so that would be okay, but it's not that easy to come up with prior, and I'm not going to dive much into it right now. So, yeah, we talked about some naive estimators, now about Bayesian estimator, and I want to talk to add some spice to our problem. So we said that each of our panel possess some bias, right? Demographic, as we saw, as we can guess from here for our example, maybe interest, technology orientation, country of origin. So uh, you can imagine yourself that, that fresh parents are more likely to use apps that are more uh, related to parents, but are less might be for um, as a sport fans like NFL. They we, we can see there that they are overestimating for a NFL app and all the sports app, right? As we saw before. Now I want to add some spice. Imagine, imagine yourself that we, as, we ask the users and they agree, agreed to share with us their metadata. So instead of just having the user, uh, whether he opened or, or did not open the app, now we also have age, gender, income level, and few more uh, metadata. So now we need to come up with a new estimator, okay? Propensity score. This is where our, uh, the part of propensity score is getting uh, to the front stage. So what is propensity score and why we need it? If panels were randomly sampled, which we know that they are not, we are not in a problem, right? But they are biased. And this is also called observational study. Propensity score actually helps us to turn an observational study in your, into pseudo-randomized trial by reweighting samples, and I will show you a, a, a concrete example just in a second. Propensity scores uh, methods are used to draw causal inferences from observational data, and observational data is the data we can't control. We just get it, we see, we can see, just like here in the photo, we only can see what we get, we can't control, we can't ask ourselves, okay, we want more uh, samples from this group or from that group. We can't do that. We just get the, the data and we need to do something with it. So let's uh, give some example. We want to ask ourselves, what, uh, should the government fund AI job training? So uh, what would we do? We have uh, X, which is a d-dimensional vector for each of our uh, participants. Uh, for example, seniority level, academic background, I don't know, why data participation, whatever. And then we split them to get the job training. Actually, that's not a good example, because it is an AI job training, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, then we split them to control and treatment group, uh, which would be T, denoted by T, the indicator here. And why would be their income one year after training? What we are interested to test is uh, to, ask, to ask ourselves, does job training raise average future income? Okay. If we know that AI job training uh, increase future income, we have a conclusion that we came up with uh, and we can, uh, I don't know, decide to do that uh, uh, gov by the government and stuff like this. I want to uh, define Y0 and Y1. These are the incomes for control and treated group. And ATE here on the bottom, which will be average treatment effect, the expectation of the delta between Y1 and Y0. Now, if we were completely at random, we weren't on a problem. Here what we can see is a scatter plot of two uh, features for each of the individuals. X1 here is the seniority level, and X2 is academic background. If we can see uh, uh, the green dots are those who got the AI job training, and the red dots did not get the AI job training, they are control. If we are completely at random, we just average the, de the delta between, all the between these two groups, and there was no problem at all, right? However, what happens that we do see some bias, like in this situation? When you can see a group on the right upper side, a group of uh, green dots, and on the left lower side, a, gro a group of red dots. Now, if we take the average de delta between Y1 and Y0, we can't uh, really account on this uh, conclusion, right? Because maybe the seniority level and academic background made people to go into the AI job training, and then their income might be affected by these two features, and not only by the AI job training, right? So what we can we do? 
Um, how about matching? What we do at matching is that we, found for, we find for each of the individuals in each of the two groups, here I just uh, circled four, but we are looking for the, a couple um, a most similar instance from the other group. So from the control group, we are looking for the control group, for the treated group, sorry, the most close, closer one, and then we can see the individual treatment effect, how these two, the income from these two individuals were different, okay? Because they are very close by the features. So we can t take uh, all of the matching like here, and then average their effect. Is that clear so far? Yeah? Excuse me? No, you, ca you can look on, on all of them. I just uh, circled four just for the sake of uh, simplicity. So yeah, so one of the um, uh, disadvantages here is uh, how do we measure uh, similarity and the curse of dimensionality is also an issue. Uh, it's just um, as a continuation to what you just said. And we also can be misled by features that don't uh, affect the outcome. Okay, so matching is not that a good idea. It's like to do K and N, if I'm sure you guys are familiar with. It's not also always that a good idea. And what about uh, using inverse propensity weighting that instead of just using, uh, looking on the matching, we actually give them different weights as you just saw here. So instead of uh, treating each of the individuals equi uh, equally, we are giving them um, weights according to their um, um, to uh, their part in this. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm just going to go into it just a second. Um, according to uh, how they are likely to be in their uh, feature space. Okay. So how do we do that in two phases? The first one is to calculate feature score. Feature score is this model. It's just um, uh, uh, probability. I'm going to go into it a little bit more further because I, I'm no, I know you, you can see on the back. I'm going to give a concrete example. We are, we are uh, calculating propensity score, which would be the probability for each of the instances to get treated, to get the job training. And then we will weight each of the users by the inverse of this probability. So if, for example, this instance is much le less likely to get the job training because it is very on the right and then the, on the upper side. If we give it weight by the inverse of the propensity score, it will get higher weight and vice versa. These instances are more likely to get treated because they are very in this, uh, in this area that we see lots of uh, instances like them. So we give them weight by the inverse of the propensity score. And I'm going to give a concrete example just in a second. Yeah. To get this probability that you divide <coughs> by, you also need some similarity measure of distance. Um, not really. So he said that this, to come up with this propensity score, we need to come up, we need a similarity measure. Um, we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but it's, it's, it's just a loss function in any machine learning model, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. Later, sorry. So again, as we saw, if we, if we see overrepresented samples, we want to give them lower weights, and over and underrepresented sorry, uh, samples, we give them overweights, bigger weights. Okay? So two necessary conditions we need to remember before we continue talking about uh, propensity score. The first one is ignorability. The incomes of the independent of, uh, are independent sorry, of the treatment assignment conditional on, on convariance X. So that means that if we split users to treatment or control, it does not affect the outcome. Just uh, for the sake of how we divide them. The second uh, condition is common support or overlap. That means that both treatment groups have some common samples X. We don't want to be in a situation where our control group is only formed of out of uh, female analysts and our treatment group will be male engineers. If we, if we have this situation, we can't really build a classifier that uh, could uh, come up with a proper uh, propensity score that accounts for um, their occupation and their gender. So let's uh, make some derivation and then I'm going to deep, deep, deep dive into uh, uh, some example uh, of how we do that. 
So average shipment effect, as I said, is the expectation between y1, the delta between y1 and y0, and we assume that we have x comes from p of x. We know all of the distribution of x. However, what we do know, we, we do observe from the data, uh, we know the outcome of the users only, uh, the, of the treated users, only the users that were in the treatment group. Okay? We don't know how were their outcome if they were in the control group. And if we were to know these two uh, distribution, we were not in a problem. But we do. Our data means in, uh, indicate us that we know only one situation. A user is either in the treatment group and we know its outcome, or in the control group and we know its outcome. So we don't have um, approach to x comes of p of x, but only from these two quantities. Now, if we were at random, this that, that would not matter at all, right? Because x given t of equals 1 or t equals 0, that doesn't mean anything because if we were at random. But we know that we are biased. We know that users that are in the treatment group or in the control group have different, different distribution than the, the general dis, uh, distribution of x. Now, how do we turn this distribution, as I said before, p of x given t equals 1, the users from the treatment group, into the general population, p of x? We ask ourselves Thomas Bayes again, and he tells us, you should multiply it by the, guarantee, the green term here. Uh, and here in the denominator, that's exactly the propensity score. The probability for each of the individuals to be in the treatment group. Okay? And we, we do the same for the control group. So again, if we were only to account for the users that we saw in the treatment group, as here in Y1, we are just sum over uh, these terms over uh, y1 and if we want to go to move to p comes from p of x we would need to multiply it by the green term here which we here in the denominator as i said is the propensity score here in the numerator it's a stabilizer p uh, t equals one we can estimate it uh, proportionally from uh, empirically sorry from our data uh, and something i want to mention here so imagine yourself that we want to use the propensity score but we don't know and we are in a randomized uh, trial, and our, our um, uh, separation to treatment and control group is exactly half and half, so that would be 50%, and our propensity model would do nothing to, we uh, would not be that good at um, uh, discriminating between uh, treatment and control group, so that would also be around 50%, and uh, 0.5 divided by 0.5, that would be one, and our weight would be just one. So we didn't affect at all our um, expectation of y1, okay? Any questions uh, until here? I'm sorry about the, some uh, math uh, hard times. <laughs> okay, so here's uh, our example. So uh, um, I want uh, to emphasize the, the idea of propensity score. We want to turn observational study into pseudo-randomized trial by reweighting samples. As we saw before, we want to give higher weights and lower weights to users. How we do that? We begin with train a classifier using any machine learning tool we want. But there is a red asterisk here. We need a machine learning tool or model that can give us probability, but it should be also calibrated probability. Calibra a calibrated uh, model is a model that gives us probability, but the probability has probabilistic meaning. So if, for example, it gives a 0.2 to belong to the treatment group, that means that 20% of the time it would belong to the treatment group. And not, for example, what would have happened with SVM, that its probability is not really probabilistic, right? It's the distance from the separation plane and stuff like this, not getting into it. After we have the classifier, we just weight each of the users and then we calculate the, ev the weighted ATE, average treatment effect. So let's begin. Imagine instead for a job training example, we have x, a d dimensional vector. Here only age and gender for the sake of simplicity. The treatment, may, may, uh, whether they got the job training or not, and why would be the income one year later. So we begin with all the samples. The second step would be just to drop about why. Why we don't care about the incomes what one year later. Now we need to train a model that we predict given x only the treatment whether they got the job training or not. And I, I remind ourselves, it, it should be calibrated. 
And we also are not interested in a perfect model. If we had a perfect model that can give us exactly 0 or 1, we couldn't have weight users, right? It would be tricky. So after we have this prediction, we add it to our samples, to our data, sorry. That would be t hat. And we give the weight, as we saw before, but the green term. So here, uh, for, uh, here in our example, p of t equals 1, that would be 50% of the times. We just said uh, empir empirically we estimate this uh, proportion. And we divide it in the numerator exactly by the prediction. So that would be 0, 0.5 divided by 0, uh, 6, 5, 6, 7, and so on. And we do this, the opposite for the control group. So we have here now weights for each of the users. And what we just need to do here is the average treatment effect is be became weighted. Average treatment effect of each of the users. And we get uh, the, um, uh, the outcomes for each of the group treatment and control. And we see that it's definitely different for what we, have, we could have uh, get if we were to not weight it again to the general population. That's what we did with propensity score. So again, we begin with all the samples, we drop y, we train a model, we add the predictions and we, do, we add the weight, just like the green term that we uh, saw before in the derivation according to the Bayes rule, and we get the weighted AT. So back to our problem. We are interested in estimating the proportion of active, up active users. Let's try to formulate it once again, and we, we want to use propensity score weighting to our task. So x would be the d-dimensional vector, as we said, user's metadata that was added to us. y would be the indicator of whether user opened the app or not. And now how do we define treatment and control groups? It's not as we saw before with the job training stuff. So here's an idea. Let's define a control group that will represent the general population as much as possible. Uh, for, so here I, I um, uh, took Chrome app, which would be, I guess, the most uh, general or generic app you can think of. And we took all the users that used a Chrome app as to be the control group. And against each of the panels, we build a classifier that would be the propensity score for each of the users. What is the probability to belong to the panel? Because the panels of the treatment and the control would be uh, the Chrome users. Now we don't care about the users um, in the about the usage of the app in the control group, only about the X covariates. And then we will reweight each of the users. So here's a, um, a res some results. So for each of the panel, I calculated uh, the propensity score p of t equals one given x. I used the light GBN model and calibration. I'm sure you remember why. And here is uh, some um, examination on a panel that we know that is to biased toward, towards a young woman. So here is the distribution of propensity score. And we can definitely see two populations or two modality, B modality. And if we examine, look into it, we can see that 67% appear here on this uh, area of a uh, higher percentage of, uh, of uh, pro uh, propensity score which match, much more, match lots of sense for us because individuals that get higher uh, predictions, as we can see here on the right side, are much more likely to be in our panel that we know that is biased towards young women. So young women will get higher predictions because they are, we are looking on a biased panel and lower predictions will be much more like the total population. And that's exactly what you get here with 50% a female. And then we weight by the inverse. So if we see here a uh, female that are overrepresented, we'll give them the inverse of this pr pr prediction to account for this overrepresented representative uh, presentation uh, in the panel. And this is also a nice uh, graph. I uh, split it by uh, female and male. So the uh, blue uh, distribution would be for female. Also, we are looking on propensity score. And the green one is for male. And we can definitely see that females get higher propensity score, which does make some lots of sense for us, and the female much less. So again, instead of having only access that we saw 
only in the panels that we said that each of the panels is uh, t equals 1, as we did before. Now we have x. We want to have x comes from p of x, that the general population of our uh, users. And we need to multiply each of the users by the green term here. And this is actually weighting them according to the general population that we inferred from Chrome users, as uh, we said before. Now, after we do that for each of the panels, we want to come up with pi tilde. We can just average that. And if you're looking on our uh, criteria for the estimations, so we see that panel size did not uh, did account here in here in this uh, method, in this estimator, because it didn't give any, any meaning to the panel size. size sorry. However, that's not that hard to come up with a creative uh, solution. But uh, talking about consensus and, and, and to handle inherent panels bias, we definitely account for that. Uh, regarding the panel bias, we just, that's exactly what we did with the propensity score. And co consensus is what comes up from this averaging over all the smooth uh, pies. Some uh, caveats we need to account for when we use propensity score. So our model is not 100% accurate. Obviously, as every machine learning model, it's not 100% accurate. And we should uh, take that into account. Because if our model is not good enough, we can't really uh, assume that it will give us a significant or meaningful propensity scores. And also is the calibration. The calibration, as I said, is a process to give uh, our uh, probabilities um, probabilistic meanings. And this is also a, a model, or if you can say you could call it a model. But it's also not 100% uh, accurate. We also assume the ignorability and common support. I'm sure you remember. So ignorability, separation to treatment and control group does not affect the outcomes. And common support that we see both uh, kinds of samples in treatment and control groups. And extreme weights here, because we gave weights can be very destructive. We can uh, find some, uh, I don't know, uh, weights that are uh, hundreds times um, the magnitude of power rel relative to others. And uh, as we said, uh, the last point we said uh, before. So propensity score for selection, selection bias, something you, you can take uh, with you to what you do in your daily uh, routine. So selection bias is actually just what we said, if we want to call it uh, in, a different, in different words. We have two groups that are not properly randomized, and it's it's most of the times it can happen, or not most of the time, but it can happen when we have learning set and production set. So learning set is the set that is, has labels, as we can see here. And we are training on it. We develop the best machine learning model we want. But when we deploy our model to production set that we don't have labels, sometimes production set distribution of features is much different that w than what we learned, the distribution that we learned with. So here, for example, you can see the, the orange population in the production set is much more significant that, than what we had in the learning set. If, if we want to account for that, we can just use propensity score weighting that does not require any label and to reweight the samples and to handle the selection bias. Also, when we have a propensity model, as I said here, in this example, propensity model is the likelihood the probability for each individu individual sorry, to belong to a learning set versus the production set. And this model, as it is, also insightful for what features affect the, this probability, right? So what have we learned? We talked about a pro the problem uh, that we want to estimate the proportion of a specific app. And we have several panels that we know that they are biased. Then we came up with some naive solutions. And then we talked about Bayesian estimator and propensity weighting that is giving uh, the uh, we uh, weights to users according to how likely they are to be in, in the treatment or the control group. Then uh, we talked about here, uh, we talked about the uh, selection bias. And uh, I'm sure you can use this, uh, this method when uh, you are facing your um, selection bias or whatever uh, situation you in your daily um, routine. So any questions? Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the uh, ignorability uh, axiom. 
uh, it's kind of weird to me because the the main model kind of uh, 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 kind of counts that there is no ignorability. So you're kind of like in the main model, you kind of. Uh, 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 don't assume it, and in the propensity model, you assume it. Uh, what do you mean by the main, main model? The model which you want to correct the bias for, not the propensity model. The, po the main model that uh, we talked about uh, in the first time, in the first place. It's kind of weird to assume that the uh, outcome of a person, mm -hmm. given the corrected. The characters of the person uh, uh, is independent of very of whatever is it is chosen or not chosen to go to the experience. So I want to uh, make that uh, point a little bit more uh, sharp. So what we say with ignorability that all that is affecting our outcomes might come from X's and not from the treatment uh, separation. Like, if we de decided to put this individual in the control and in the treatment group, that does not, uh, it hasn't to do anything with uh, their outcomes. So I'm not sure if that's a... Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, do you have any data about the added value of the So yeah, she asked about if we have any uh, proofs that uh, our method uh, works. It, we have, but it's a uh, proprietary, so I can't share it here. Sorry. <laughs> what I could, I, I did. <laughs> I did share. Yeah. Well, a question more for Mark. A great talk, and uh, not all of you know, but you is a very technical scientist. He's also a fresh father, and his wife came first four days ago, so give him a <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> I'll thank my wife actually. <laughs> so, excuse me. Are you sleeping at night? <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of. It's very, very fresh. I must say, it only happened uh, two days ago. So, getting used to it. So thank you very much, guys. <laughs>